الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اما بعد we are continuing our study of kitab nikah of the book of marriage as this book of marriage comes within a broader work that is entitled Minhaj Salikin wa Tawdih al Fiqh fi Din the way of the traveler clarifying fiqh within the deen clarifying law within the religion this work has been authored by the esteemed scholar Sheikh Abdul Rahman Ibn Nasir Al-Sa'di or if you like Al-Sa'di as his family will pronounce their name Rahimahullah Ta'ala may Allah the exalted bestow expansive mercy upon his soul as he passes in the year 1376 after the Hijrah coinciding with approximately 1956 or 1957 common era and in our last sitting, we concluded Bab al Ayyub fin Nikah, the chapter of hidden agendas in marriage, secret agendas in marriage, deficiencies um, that are withheld, that one knows about the self before you marry someone, you don't tell them, and you marry them anyway, and they don't know this thing about you. Now, we covered that. So, we, we now enter into Kitab al Sadaq, the book of Sadaq. And sadaq is a term that I would posit that many of us have not heard. So we use a more common term that I believe we're familiar with, mahar. In fiqh, when you see kitab al-sadaq, the book of sadaq, that is the book of mahar or the book of dowries. The book of dowries. And um, this is what we're entering into now, a discussion concerning dowries. Now, before we enter into this discussion, we need to know where we are placing this discussion. So when it comes to the shurut, the conditions of a marriage, those things that need to be in place before a marriage in order for a marriage to be valid, those are certain items. And then we have an obligation of the marriage. <laughs> Then we have an obligation uh, of the marriage that it doesn't necessarily have to be in place before the marriage, but it needs to exist with the marriage. So because it needs to exist with the marriage, this obligation can be fulfilled either before the marriage or during the marriage. And if it's not fulfilled during the marriage and the marriage has, the marriage has expired, then it is still due even after the marriage expires. That's an obligation. So we're getting ready to discuss an obligation of the marriage. As for conditions of a marriage, in order for a marriage to be valid, again, those things that must be in place before a marriage occurs, in order for the marriage to be valid, then those things are as such and in no particular order. We need to have a wali. La nikaha illa bi wali. There is no valid marriage without, without a guardian. And we've discussed that with some detail. We need to have a mutual consent between both parties that they want to marry one another. And this is established by way of ijab and qubul. This is established by way of the, uh, the, the, the wali, the guardian offering uh, the, the bride and then the groom accepting the proposal or the offer of that of that guardian, right? That establishes the mutual consent between both parties. And then we need public notice. The, the marriage needs to be publicized. And we also discuss what it means to publicize a marriage. And that means that there's a minimum of two credible Muslim witnesses and or there is some form of public notice or a different form of public notice, such as um, driving through town with the beating of a duff drum, something of this nature, something that is uh, more familiar to us here in the West. You know, you see that you see that car or that series of cars that are driving around town, hawking their horns, and they may have some different uh, confetti or cans, and that's public notice. That's what it is, right? Um, forwarding that in our time, it may be some form of a social media post. Right? You may change your status on on Facebook or something like that. Right? They got to change it to married status. Right? You can even identify who the person is that you're married. Right? All right? For the old heads that y'all still on Facebook. Right? So you know, so 
Y'all supposed to be on Instagram, but y'all really supposed to be on TikTok. But y'all ain't get the TikTok yet, so y'all on Instagram, right? So any any anywhere in that space, <laughs> we can we can achieve public notice, right? So that's the point. Those are the three conditions of a marriage, right? Um, that makes the marriage valid. Now that the marriage is valid, there is an obligation of the marriage. And the obligation, again, is not limited to the time frame that the conditions are. It doesn't have that restriction, but the obligation still has to be fulfilled. It's mandatory, right? And that obligation is sadaq. That obligation is mahav. That obligation is the dowry. The dowry is an obligation of the marriage. It is a wajib. It's not, it's not a shalat. It's not a condition. It is an obligation. And hopefully we understand the differences between the two. We hope. If not, then in questions we can clarify further. Now, the, the author here, he speaks to this dowry or this mahab or this sadaq. And he states that the dowry is something that the groom gives to the bride. And it is something holding monetary value, right? It's money, right? It's money or the equivalent of money. Or it is something that is benefited from. Or it is something that is benefited from kahidh al-Qur'an, such as memorization of the Qur'an. So it is something that holds monetary value or something that she can benefit from. One of the two, somewhere in this range. That's what a dowry is. Okay. Now, the, the author states, Yanbari takhfifuhu. It is appropriate for it to be lightened. It is appropriate for it to be lightened. Let's walk this through. Firstly, the author states, Yanbari. It is appropriate. And we've discussed this term. So when we are speaking in the language of fiqh, when we are speaking in the language of law, and a person of scholarship, he states, Yanbari, it is appropriate. What hukum is that scholar indicating? What verdict in Islam is that scholar indicating when he states, Yanbari, it is appropriate? Here are options. We got five of them. Wajib, obligatory, mustahab, optimal, mubah, neutral, makruh, reprehensible, and mehdur, number five, mehdur, unlawful, illegal, commonly stated as haram. So when yanbagi is stated, what does that mean? Which one of these five? Mustahab. It's encouraged. It's optimal. If you do this, there's reward in it for you. But if you don't do this, there's no threat of punishment, no sin, or nothing like that. Right? Good. Since we are, since we are discussing fiqh, we'll do the opposite as well. If a person of scholarship states, la yanbari, it is inappropriate or it's not appropriate, right? We're speaking from the premise of law of fiqh, then this scholar is indicating which of the five ahkam, which of the five verdicts? Makruh. Right? Makruh, right? Reprehensible. It is something displeasing to Allah, but there's no sin. Right? There's no sin if you do it, right? Okay, we understand the terminology. So he's stating, Yanbari takhfifuhu. It is appropriate that it is lightened. What is it? The dowry. It is appropriate that it is lightened. Now, we need to discuss what lightened means. Lightened doesn't mean cheap. Don't it doesn't necessarily mean that. Right? Lightened. It, it, it means that um, something that is accessible for you to facilitate, right? Something that is within your means to facilitate. And people's means may differ. People's means may, may vary, right? But between the husband and the wife, it's appropriate that between their societal statures, that is something that the, that the husband has the ability um, to, uh, to facilitate for the wife. It's not, it's not something that's too heavy, of a lift, right? So we're not stating the heaviest lift, but we're also not stating the lightest lift either to the point that it doesn't have any real meaning or value, right? We have to say it this way, um, fortunately and unfortunately, because, well, um, we know nothing like this has ever happened anywhere around 
this part of town. We know that. However, in this country, we have heard of a, uh, of a value meal as a dowry at the McDonald's. You know, Coke and a smile with a cheeseburger. That's your dowry, sister. Right? We, we, we've heard of a six-pack of Pepsi as a dowry. Right? And then there is the, um, the, the, the more regular, I'm not saying better, but the more regular, um, I'm going to give the sister uh, some Jill Babs. I'm give the sister some Jill Babs. I'm going to give the sister some books, right? That type of thing happens, right? All right. So, and we're not saying that's bad either. We're not saying that's bad either. Now, we need to understand, though, what the dowry actually represents and what's taking place with it. We've all heard the verse, الرِّجَالُ قُوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ Men are maintainers and protectors of women. Men are responsible for women. We've all heard the verse before. So does Nisa, right? We're familiar, right? Okay. How does this connect to the dowry? Because from its meanings, it's directly connected to the dowry. The meaning of this is the men that are in this woman's life, the men that are in your life that have been responsible for you, your father, your uncles, your grandfather, your brothers, whoever those men are for you that have been responsible for you in your life, that's, they've been looking out for you. When this dowry is given and the dowry is accepted, it represents a transition in that responsibility from the shoulders of those men to the shoulders of the groom. That's what it represents, right? So the understanding is meant to be Again, we're not saying the marriage is not valid if it's not done this way. We're not saying that. The validity is hinging on the conditions. We're not talking about conditions. The dowry is an obligation. But what we, the, the meaning of this is the quality of life that these men have been providing for this woman with regards to her, her societal stature, with regards to her, her safety, with regards to um, her her, her monetary, her, her, quali her entire quality of life and everything that, that means for her, monetary and otherwise, right? The way that she's spoken to, the way that she's handled, the way that she's treated, right? The way that she's touched, the way that she's not touched, all of that for her and the way that these men have been taking care of her, that is the expectation in what is being shifted to you when you give this diary. That's the understanding behind the diary. That's what it represents. You follow? And it goes a little bit further than that, too. Um, and yes, a six-pack of Pepsi, absolutely. We're not going to say the city, right? But yes, that, that has happened, all right? Now, and of course, we also, we, we, all, we also get the pious sister, the pious sister that be like, oh, no, 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 brother, I don't want a dowry. It's okay. I, I, I forego my right. You can do that. Understand what it means when you do that, though, right? Now, let's look at this on the other far side of the spectrum. Now, at some point, because we can, we can talk real with y'all, right? We can be real. Right? We can talk marriage in real life, right? Uh, we, there, there is an ideal, but we're not always at the ideal. Sometimes we're just in our reality. So I got to talk to our reality sometimes, okay? Now, most marriages, at some point in time, from the wife, there's going to be a phrase that comes from her mouth. Might be a whole sentence. I want a chula. Give me a chula. Right? Now, brothers, y'all can act like y'all never heard that before. That's okay. Sisters, y'all can act like y'all never said it before. That's okay, too. But this comes out sometimes. This comes out sometimes, right? All right. Now, we're going to get to the khula, inshallah ta'ala, because after we finish out these sections, we actually do get into areas of divorce. But this is connected to the diary, so we're going to discuss this now. One of the components that is connected to the khula, that is connected to the dissolution of the marriage or the dissolving of the marriage, is the woman giving back the diary. 
the woman giving back the dowry, right? Again, there's some more details there. We're going to cover when we get to it. But the woman giving back the dowry. Now, if all you gave her is a six-pack of Pepsi, brother, it's easy for her to take your little six-pack of Pepsi. Let me out, right? So you can give a cheap dowry if you want to, right? However, if you offered a dowry that had some more value to it, right? Maybe even something that may be a bit of a, of a heavier lift for her. It's not as easy for her just to come out of her mouth asking you for a whole lot, my brother. That's a solution for you. <laughs> right? Kind of the way you enter into this thing, right? Sometimes det determines how you, how you exit and out. Right? Because most of the time, most of the time, when the sister's asking for a whole lot, in all honesty, she don't mean it. Sometimes she does mean it. Most of the time, brothers, I'm most of the time she don't mean it. She say it, but she don't mean it. All right? So it's your responsibility to understand which is which. Is she really serious about this? Or does she really just want me to kind of change how I do something a little bit? Did I do something that upset her and upset her this much and now that she's saying this? Or is it real? And she is serious. She's done. She wants out. Right? But if the dowry is proper, she's going to make a lot of considerations before she gets to that point and she's going to try to work it out with you. Right? This is kind of the value you're, you're placing on your marriage. So the only value that you placed on your marriage was trying to get as much as a discount as possible in order to access, in order for a law to make her permissible for you, right? You trying to get the, 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 the biggest discount that you can on that, but you expect her to value the marriage more than you did? You didn't even value the marriage enough to put as much as you could put into it on the front end. You expect her to value it more? Does that make sense? All right, so this is what is going on with the doubt. Right. This is what is going on with the dowry. The dowry, the, the, the same way, again, details are coming, but the same way that this dowry, the, the woman can ask for whatever she wants to ask for, big, small, or indifferent. We spoke about what's appropriate. We just spoke about what's appropriate, right? But if it's large, if it's small, if it's a heavy lift, if it's a lighter lift, permissible for her to request it, if you agree to it, well, that's on you now. Now it's on because you agreed to it. You didn't have to agree to it, but you agreed to it. So now that's on you, right? Okay. So the same way that you're entering into the marriage through the dowry, with the chulah, you're doing the exact opposite to unravel that, right? Because it is through the dowry that you are accessing her, right? It is through the dowry that you're taking responsibility for her. So with the hula, when she gives the dowry back, it is unraveling your responsibilities and it is taking the, uh, these rights away, right? It's taking this responsibility off of you. That's what it represents, right? So understanding, understand that when you put whatever you put into that, into that dowry, right? Before, and if you want it to be a stack of books, it can be a stack of books. Just understand how easy it is for her to take them books off the shelf and say, here, brother, that's all I'm saying. Do it if you want to, right? Go ahead. All right. Hey, I feel like I think it's today. You put to give your wife a house for a dollar, she thinks twice. She thinks twice. That's true. That's true. Okay. So we know what we're talking about now. So now we can talk about it, right? You over here giving the sisters ideas and all that. We ain't nobody saying anything about that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue. So the text states, Su'ilat Aisha. Aisha was asked, may Allah be pleased with her. Kim kana sadaqun nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How much was the dowry of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Meaning the dowry that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave to Aisha. Right? Aisha. Okay. Qalat, she states, that his dowry for his wives. So he had a standard, right? He had a standard, right? His dowry for his wives, it was 10 and a half uqiyah. 10 and a half uqiyah. 
Of course, that doesn't mean anything to us. So we're going to keep talking so it can have some meaning. Atedidi um, menesh. Do you know what a half is? Qultu la. I said no. Qalat nisfu uqiyah. It is half of an uqiyah. Now, still, what is an uqiyah? What's going on here, right? What's, what's, what's uh, 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 um, or rather 12. I stated 10. 12 uqiyah. 12 and a half. 1, 2.5. 12 and a half uqiyah. That is the equivalent of khamsu mia dirham. 500 dirhams. 500 dirhams. Okay? 500 dirhams. This is collective by Muslim. But now you're still lost. We're not using dirhams, right? Okay. So the equivalent of 500 dirhams is 42 sheep. 42 sheep, right? 42 sheep. Now, now that you know that uh, 500 dirhams is the equivalent of 42 sheep, now we can go a couple different ways with this. We can go the way now. What was the value of... 500 dirham during the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in comparison to our time now we can go that route or we can go what's the value of 42 sheep today right or we can go what's the value of 42 sheep today okay all right so uh, if you if you do the if you do the math on it right 500 dirham during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is equivalent of 200 bucks right 200 bucks right if for benefit since we're talking, right? Do you know where the term buck came from? Anybody know? You know why we say bucks? Like, you ever ask, like, why are we saying bucks? What is a buck? Right? Uh, right, but what is a buck? Right? So in the English language, what is a buck? Like, uh, y'all do basketball? Milwaukee Bucks? Right? Good, right? So it's, it's, it's a buck, right? With the, with the antlers, right? Okay, good. So the skin of a buck was utilized as an exchange of value right as a um, as a reserve note right for to 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 symbolize the amount of gold and silver that you had i'm going to give you this to represent that so i'm not going to carry around a whole bunch of gold and silver on me so you can rob me i'm just saying i got it the buck represents that right how many bucks you got right okay but two hundred dollars. All right. Now, there is a universal principle in fiqh, al ada muhakkama, that culture is a judge. So we understand certain things in the context of our culture. So we should shift in this discussion the value of forty-two sheep. To 42 sheep today. So uh, we just passed Eid al Adha and all of that. We know some of the brothers did the sacrifice. How much you pay? 300, right? And that's that's peak season. It's not costing that much right now. It's not 300 or 300 ahead right now, right? So let's just estimate. And let's just say you say 100. You know I'm going, so he's he trying to make it cheaper. Look, look, look. The businessman over here, huh? <laughs> All right, so but let's go with that. All right, let, let, let's go with your hundred, right? So if, if we go with your hundred, and we say forty-two sheep, that's now what? 4, that's forty-two hundred dollars, right? And if we go with two hundred, right? We're going to double that. Now you're saying eighty-four hundred dollars, right? Okay. Now you're thinking in terms of what a dowry would be, right? The the value of what the Messenger of Allah said was given to his wives as as a dowry during that time, right? Sheep had its own independent value. It still has value today, but people at that time, right, they, they would do barters. They would do barters, right? So I'll give you I'll give you five sheep in exchange for a this, right? So think about that. So 42 sheep, this is now an asset, right? So the Prophet ﷺ didn't just give things, he gave things that had, had value, right? And if we're saying the equivalent of 42 sheep, sheep themselves are an asset. They're an asset. They are a reproducing uh, uh, product, right, as it were, right? A sheep can give birth to more sheep, right? 
A sheep can produce milk. A sheep can produce fur. Meaning what? So if something happened to you, they, they can be taken care of a little bit. You down to seconds. Okay. <laughs> right? So something that can take care of them in the absence of you, something happens to you. Right? If something is going on and you're, you're out of town and you're otherwise, um, you're otherwise occupied with something, they have something. They have something. Right? They're not necessarily dependent on you for every single individual dollar in that moment because you put something aside in the kitty for them. Right? And since we're talking about it, this is a little bit outside of the dowry, but inside of the, the realm of the discussion of marriage, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what's the first thing he did when he got to Medina? Let's do a little bit of history, a little bit of Sirah. Go ahead. Okay, good. He built houses for his wives, right? One of the first things he did. Now, we often talk about one of the first things that he did was build fellowship amongst the Muhajirin and the Ansar, the Meccans and, the, and the, uh, the, the people of Medina, right? People of Mecca, people of Medina. And he made a, um, a contract between them, right? Like a family contract be between them that they had to look out for each other, whoever you were paired with, right? Whoever you were paired with. To the extent that in the beginning, if one of them passed away, then the other was able to inherit from the wealth of that person until that was abrogated. But this is so everybody could get on their feet and, and be economically sound because if we're talking about building community, if we're talking about having impact on society, one of the first things the Messenger of Allah did was build an economic base for the people. He built an economic base for himself and for the people. That's what he did, right? That's what he did. So if we're talking about building institutions and then we're also talking about being dependent on the people to fund those institutions, then we need to put the people in position so that they can fund the institutions. <laughs> it's base logic, right? You, you have these institutions, but then the people that you want to support it don't have the means to support it, right? And then it feels like you bleeding them dry, and then, they, and then now they resistant. Why you keep asking us? And you know that you build this thing, right? That that builds negative tension, right? Don't gotta be that way. The way the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it, he he builds uh, this uh, fellowship between the Muhajirin and the Ansar. He gets into Medina, he buys land, right? He buys land. Okay, um, it's actually something that he did before the. Before the fellowship piece, before buying land, it's something else that he did first, right? And we should understand this as, as men who are looking to marry women, we should understand the mentality of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, you, you know and you understand that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the ruler of Medina when he got to Medina, right? So the, the Pledge of Aqaba, the Pledge of the Mountain Pass, there were two of them before the Hijra to Medina, where people from Medina were coming in to make Hajj. The Prophet Sallallahu would meet with them, and they're kind of discussing and negotiating what the agreements are going to be before he takes over rulership of Medina, right? That happened two years, two years in a row before he made the final decision, right? As a part of the agreement in those negotiations, was that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have the majority share in control of the date economy and the gold economy of Medina. The date in the gold market, the majority of it, he had the controlling stakes in it. That was part of the agreement. So when he came in to Medina, he was, he was ruling Medina and he, had, he secured his own economic status first. He made sure he was secure financially, right? He wasn't overly dependent upon the people. People have this understanding. Um, and I get where we get it from. But people have this understanding that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was poor. No, he wasn't poor. The messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wealthy. It's only that he gave it all up for Islam and the Muslims. It's only that he chose to live a lifestyle that didn't reflect luxury, but he had it though. He had it. And he had it in reoccurring fashion. He had cash flow. Wait, I talk all language. He had cash flow. He had net worth and he had cash flow. Right? So we should understand that. 
right? Before we decide we're going to go the, the pauper route, right? Weigh that against, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying in this country, we're looking to establish and grow ourselves. We can't establish and grow ourselves without an economic base. We can't establish and grow ourselves without being independent and financially free, right? We need space freedom. We need time freedom. We need financial freedom. We need to create economy for ourselves, right? This is the understanding of the message of Allah Sallallahu He came into Medina on that, right? And then whatever Islam needed, all right, I'm gonna give as much as I can. Oh man, I'm out. Abu Bakr, what you got? Omar, what you got? Uthman, what you got? Right? He gave up his first, though. He gave it his first. That's leadership. Right? Okay. Now, now that we understand that, most of us have heard that one of the first things that he did coming into Medina, he established two masjids coming into Medina. We familiar? The first masjid that he established was what? Quba. Right, Master Quba, absolutely. Right, that's when he's kind of coming in. Uh, Quba at the time was on the outskirts of Medina, but Medina has expanded now, so Quba is inside of Medina now. But it was kind of on the outskirts as his, at that time. He's coming in, took a break, settled. Muslims are there. They established Quba. He rests for a bit. He comes into Medina. Fine. He gets to Medina. Sahel and Suhail, kids. Sahel and Suhail were kids at the time, right? They had land. They had land. The Prophet ﷺ purchased the land from them, right? He didn't say, oh, Fisa Bidi love, brothers, right? He didn't say that. He could have, and sometimes it was that, right? But it's kids, they, they own land, which also tells us that whoever was before them left them something of value when they were gone. <laughs> they left their kids some land, right? All right. And on some of this land, you had date palm trees. Dates and gold, they were from the main, uh, that was from the main market of Medina, right? It sounds like we, we, we weigh out, but we're bringing this back around, right? We need to have a vision of the community that the marriages are being, the environment that the marriages are being established in, right? All right. So there's some date palm trees there. There's land that he purchases it. That's the land that the prophet's master was built on. Right? That's the land that the prophet's master was built on. And then on that same land that he bought, he also built homes for his wives. So he had land, he had property, he owned homes for his wives, and he gave each wife their own quarters to live in. They had their own independent space to live in, right? That was comfortable for them at the time that they were living. Right? Okay. So, all this happens, right? All this happens, okay? So, it is in this space, in this environment. Now, you can see, okay, he can afford to get 500 dirhams every time he gets married, right? He got a little something. He's not asking people to give him money so that he can get married. He got it. He got it. He got another home. Okay, I got married. Okay, I got a home for you over here. All right? That's how the message of Allah said him was. All right? All right, moving forward, now that we understand that. For uh, Sophia, his dowry to her, he freed her. And in his freeing her was his dowry for her. This is agreed upon. So Sophia, she was an attractive woman. She was an attractive woman. She was also a woman of Jewish heritage. Uh, Jewish, she, she was Jewish. Right, that was her that was her faith practice okay now the, the short of this the short of this the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, there are some battles that take place right there are about a hundred of them a little more than a hundred of them depending on how you number them right and in, in these in this particular battle those of Jewish faith lost the battle because as you know there were three main Jewish tribes I feel like we're doing Seder now right there were three main Jewish tribes in Medina all of them broke the treaty. They broke the covenant, the agreement that they had with the Prophet when they came into Medina. All, each one of those tribes broke it, right? That's treason from a governmental standpoint. It was treason, right? And treason is an act of war, right? So they took the first move. 
They tried to assassinate him. They tried to take over Medina. They tried to subplane Islam. It was acts of war, right? So in one of these battles, uh, after treason, they lost. They lost, right? Now, what happens, what, what happens, and we discussed some of this when we were discussing uh, slavery laws. Those who, those that have lost the battle, it is possible that they can become enslaved, right? They become a part of the spoils of war. And then they get they get divvied up amongst the Muslims for the Muslims now to take care of them. You're coming into our household now, right? Your, your men couldn't take care of you. Your men lost their lives, lost their lives. We're not going to leave you out there. We're going to take care of you now. We're going to absorb you into our households and our society, right? Fine. Now, when they lose, Sophia is amongst them. And Sophia was actually part of the spoils of another Sahabi. Look at the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? They say he's a warmonger, he's a slave driver, they're gonna say the Arab slave trade, they're gonna say all of the stuff they say. Look at the real history, look at the Sirah. This is what he did with Sophia. Another Sahabi, he he was uh, she was in she was in his spoils. So the Prophet, he then purchases Sophia, right? Purchases Sophia, she embraces Islam, he marries her. Because the free have to marry the free. Right? So he purchases her, frees her, she embraces Islam, right? He marries her. Now the entire Jewish tribe, non Muslims, they are his in laws now. So who from the Sahaba is going to enslave the family of the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu so then all the Sahaba freed him immediately. That's the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you call him a slave driver. That's how he moved. Right, so he married Sophia this way, right? So this is the understanding when we say that his diary to Sophia was freeing her, right? He got her out of out of a out of a bad situation and benefited everybody in one move. <laughs> in one move, right? Smart move. Okay. So understanding how we're going into these marriages, right? So now, what are you doing for your wife on that level when you come into the marriage with her? That's what the Messenger of Allah said him did. This is how he's approaching marriage, right? So he leveraged the dowry this way, right? He leveraged the dowry to benefit everybody. You got, you got freedom. You got, you got family now. Now, how much more are these people of Jewish faith going to be inclined toward Islam? Because you know you betrayed the covenant with the Messenger of Allah said You know you committed treason. You know you tried to kill him, acts of war, all of that, right? Then you lost the battle. They could have did whatever they wanted with you. He said, you know what? Y'all my family. I got y'all. Don't even worry about it. How much more inclined they going to be toward Islam? Right? And today, going to Medina, see if you can find a person of Jewish faith there. Right? So he won. He won. Okay. Moving forward. And he said, Allah, he said to a person, he said to a man, il temas walo khatim min hadid Give something, even if it is an iron ring. Even if it is an iron ring. This is agreed upon. Meaning that Islam encourages marriage so much. And the stability of family so much. That even those of lesser means. Then you should still get married. But get married in accordance with the means that you have. It doesn't mean try to identify the cheapest thing possible. This wasn't the norm of giving an iron ring, or just finding a metal ring and just, just give her just a metal ring. That wasn't the norm, this was the exception. But even for these people that are in these circumstances, still get married, give what is of value to you on the level where you are, right? Everybody in where they are. Moving forward. So a dowry, it is everything that has actual value. It is everything that has real value. Even if the value is lower, it is still a valid dowry. It is still a valid dowry. Now, let's get into uh, let's get into some of the good stuff. So, if a person marries a woman and he does not state a dowry for her and she also does not remit her dowry 
She didn't say I'm giving up my right to a dowry. But there was nothing specified. Falaha Mahab al Mithil. Then her dowry is the standard. Her dowry then by default becomes the standard. What is the standard? The standard is whatever the standard of a dowry is in the culture that you are in, in the place that you are in, in the time that you are in. Which means, yet again, we as Western Muslims, we as American Muslims, have our own culture. We have to accept that and we have to absorb that because there are certain areas of Islam that we cannot practice without a culture and there are certain areas of Islam we cannot practice when we want to absorb the culture of another people into our own, right? So then the question becomes, amongst American Muslims broadly, right? Or amongst American Muslims in the area where you are, we are in Maryland, right? We are in Baltimore. What is the standard that most Muslims will give as a dowry? What's the standard? What's the average? If we don't have an answer for that, we got some work to do. Because we should have a standard that we have established. Right? Go ahead. Yes. I mean, if you, actually, the culture is unstable. Mm. If you, if you, it, it's realistic. It's, it's mm. unstable. So okay. Our culture is unstable. Go ahead. If you go by uh, uh, Zales, or if you go by, you know, like K's or whatever. Zales, K's. Okay. Yeah, but now you're talking now. Standard, like for Christians. Uh, and coming from a Christian society and also Jewish society in America, uh -huh. it's like a ring. Uh -huh. And most women talk about a ring. Mm -hmm. But even in that case, the culture is still unstable. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, but it's a starting point, right? So, 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 so the fact that you said kales, uh, good, K's and zales, right? K's and zales, right? The fact that you said that means there is something that we think about when it comes to dowries as American Muslims. Mm -hmm. As American Muslims, most of us think jewelry. That's a standard. Does it, who said jewelry? Nobody said jewelry. Does it have to be jewelry? No, it doesn't have to be jewelry. What's dictating that? Culture. Culture, right? So we have a culture. We have a culture, right? Some form of, some form of jewelry, more often than not, to your point, right? Regardless of how, uh, how Muslim she is, She's still going to ask for. So, Y'all said it. I ain't said. She's still going to ask for a ring. Go ahead. So you only get one dowry. Huh? <laughs> well, 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 well. Again, it's 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 whatever she asks for that the groom agrees to, or anything that uh or anything that the groom offers that the let me say it differently anything that she has requested that both the wali and the groom agree to or anything that the groom has offered that the wali, that the guardian and the bride have agreed to, right? So if, if she's smart and she got a package deal for you and you accept it, it's one package, but it's a package. But, but also, but also, sisters, once you once you made that uh, suggestion or request, and it was it was accepted and given, that's it. <laughs> so uh, so be wise if you want to put a package deal together, or you want this or that, right? But once once you set the dowry, and you you received it, I mean that that's it. That's the dowry. Go ahead. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that we had a right to like make an offer. I we do. That the sister. Mm -hmm. Makes her choice, and then if, if mm -hmm. you can't ask her to decrease her in her choice, because mm -hmm. it's like haram. No, no, you can negotiate. Oh, you you say negotiate. You can, yeah, it's it's open and, until it's agreed upon, until it's actually agreed upon, and the exchange is actually made. It's open. I don't tell the way love marriage. Is. <laughs> no, because I I'm, thought it was a sin to to ask the sister well, if she asked for a thing. Uh huh. To, to negotiate with her to try to no. increase her dowry. Mm -hmm. I thought that was. No. 
No, no, no. And uh, the questioner here is stating, isn't there a hadith where a poor man gives a ring as a, as a maha? Yes, we, did, we just took that hadith. Il temis wal khatimin min hadid. Right, give something even if it is a, a ring of, uh, of iron. Right, we, did, we just took that. Thank you very much. Uh, may Allah reward your comment. So, and moving forward. The, the test goes on in the states. Then talaqaha qabla dukhul. So if he divorces her before he enters her, we understand the language, before consummation, right? Because you know we got some tasters out here, right? All right, so if he divorces her before he enters her, then it is for her to have a mut'a. We're going to discuss what a mut'a is, right? It is for her to have a gift. It is for her to have a gift. Uh, so the person of means, he gives in accordance with his means, and the person of lesser means gives in accordance with his means, right? Because some of us are people of means, like you got a little bit, right? So it's a little bit easier for you to give something that's a little bit nicer, a little more expensive, whatever it is, right? But because of your level, like you can do that, it ain't hurting you that much, right? But for somebody of lesser means, then you give a gift in accordance with your means, right? All right, now this, this is a slam. This is a slam. Because when it comes to divorce, a lot of us, we live in an emotional space when we're divorcing, right? Be emotional if you want to, but this is a slam, right? This is Islam right here, right? So, you know, you, you divorced her. You don't want to be with her no more. You pronounce talab, you say it. Right? She ain't say it. You said it. For whatever your reasons are. Now when it's time for you to part ways with her, give a little something. Do something nice for her. That's the slamming. I ain't doing enough for her. Get up out of here. Get up out of my house. Right? Good riddance. Counting down, huh? One month. Two weeks left. Get up out of here. Right? Give her a slam. Give her a gift. Right? You say, what's the evidence of that? Okay, let's look at this. Look, look at this ayah. This particular verse, it comes in Al-Baqarah 236. Again, Al-Baqarah 236. Alright, this is the last ayah that we have. There is no janah upon you, right? A janah, like literally, is like a like a wing, right? Like a like like a wing, right? Uh, but the, but the meaning when you whenever you see la janaha alika la janaha alikum like in the Quran, it means it's not a sin. It means it's not a sin if you do this, meaning that it can be mustahab for you to do this. It's encouraged for you to do this. You don't have to. But it's proper. You're supposed to do this. Okay? What's the verse take? If you divorce women and you have not touched them, we understand what touch them means, uh, entered into her or consummated the marriage, all right, to be clear, or you haven't obligated anything upon yourself with her, Right, because you know, guys, when you know you, you first trying to get a woman, you just say all type of stuff, put stuff on you, obligate stuff on yourself. You ain't gotta obligate, right? She probably would have married you anyway without you obligating all that stuff on you, right? And if you had to obligate all that stuff on you for you to marry her, should you to marry you, right? You should have been enough for her, right? All right. Anyways, the verse goes on. Uh, give. A gift to them, give provision to them, give something of value to them, right? This is what the verse is stating, give something of value to them. When what? You divorce them. So this isn't coming into the marriage, this isn't like the idda is finishing up, it's over. Give her something, do something nice for her. Allah then states, the musir, the person of, like musir, like wasir, like expansive, so a person that has means, given accordance with the means that you have, and a person that is poorer or has lesser means, then given accordance with the means you have, but do something nice for the girl. Right? Do something nice for her. Right? He states, uh, Again, my translation, 
Mata' is like a commodity. Ma'roof is something that's good. Give her a good commodity. Right? Okay. This is haqqan al muhsinin. This is a right over the people of Ihsan. Not the people of Islam. Not the people of Iman. The people of Ihsan. The people of beauty. The people that worship Allah as though they see Him. And if they can't see Allah, they know that they see Him. They know that He sees them. Right? The person that is the Muhsin. This person is going to try to do that. Meaning, if you're not doing this, you might not be a Muhsin. Right? So check that when you're angry and you, you know, you, you don't be this woman no more and you're acting all nasty to her and all of that. Check that about yourself. Right? Are you in the space of Ihsan? Right? Because Ihsan. There is no like stipulation that, okay, well, I am emotional, so I don't have to be a muhsin because I'm emotional. Give me that ayah, give me that hadith, it ain't there, right? So divorce can be an emotional thing. It doesn't negate the fact that you should be, still be striving for ihsan, still be striving for beauty in your person and in your Islam, even when you are divorcing a person, even when you're upset. Yes? But in this case, like you were saying, If the man is divorcing the woman, he doesn't have a right to that dowry is hers. Right? Now, yes? So the lawyer said it. You said like when you um divorce, yes. you know, divorce mm -hmm. still give her a gift. Still give her a gift. Right there, put in the state of mind. See, that put in the state of mind. She might come back. She might come back. She gonna think about that. She gonna think about that gift you gave her now, brother. Right? She she yeah, she she got something for her to remember you by, right? Allah Tabarak wa Taala is giving you game. Yep. He giving you the game, right? All right. The sound is off. Yes. Okay. All right. Love what you count. Uh, what book you taking from? Can the husband force? Look like they hear me. They, they respond and everything we're saying. All right, we'll come back. Oh no, you, you mean you mean this one? All right, tell them to come on Instagram then. They'll be fine. All right. Now, let's get through this because we are uh, we're pushing time. So, um, the dowry is due in full. The dowry is due in full either at death or by entrance. Okay? So if you die and you haven't paid it yet, you, you still owe that. Even in your death. Even in your death. Right? So now maybe some of this may be taken from the inheritance or what you have in your will or whatever it is. You still got to pay that. So don't, don't delay your dowry. Don't delay your dowry, right? Try to take care of it on the front. If you can give it in a hole before you marry her, do that. If it's going to take a year or two, or even five, whatever it is, but, but get it done. Get it done because it is the debt upon you into their resurrection to fulfill. Your death doesn't even remove the right of the dowry, right? So the dowry becomes due either by your death or by your entrance of her. Right? So, you know, brothers with your desires and all of that, and it's permissible you married her, right? It's permissible. But understand, at the point that you consummate, you owe. Right? You can't you you can't just you can't just do that with her and then this thing is all good. You do that, you owe. Right? That's the point in when it is doing full. Now, if you divorced her before that point in time, right, before you entered her. It's possible you might get a discount on the dowry, but you still gotta give us some, right? But uh, but this is that point. Now, if it is before entrance, the author states, if it is before entrance, meaning if there's a divorce before entrance, then half of the dowry is due. Whatever you guys agreed upon, you still owe her half of that, meaning that you're the one. Divorcing her like you have pronounced the, the talaq, right? The man has pronounced divorce on her. The man is the one that no longer desires to be with her. He's pronounced a divorce. 
he hasn't consummated, you'll half of what you agreed to. You'll have. You consummate, you're the whole thing. Right? All right. So, it is possible, though, for the man to be absolved of the dowry if, if the separation is occurring because of her. If the separation is occurring because of her, meaning she is requested a khular. Because in her fulfilling the khular, she is doing what? Giving the dowry back. She's giving a dowry back, right? So now we run into this scenario sometimes where the husband hasn't given any dowry at all and the wife wants a khular. Now what do you do? She doesn't have a dowry to give back because he never gave it. It cancels each other out. It's a wash, right? It's a wash. Um, or if the marriage is annulled, because of a defect, because of a hidden agenda, right? Something that she hid from him, right? Something that she hid from him and he finds out about it. Well, if I, if I, if I knew that, I wouldn't have married you. Why did you, you keep that from me, right? That is, a, that is a reason to dissolve the marriage, right? And in that instance, he doesn't, doesn't owe the dowry, right? Sometimes brothers hide some things, in order to get with the woman, sometimes the woman hides some things in order to get with the man, right? But if the woman hides something in order to get with the man, and this comes out into something that the man can't, right, he can't handle, and he wants to absolve the marriage, then he doesn't owe the dowry, right? And uh, you can use your imagination as to what those things possibly could be, right? There are things that people, people hide, right? People hide illnesses at times, right? People hide illnesses. Uh, people hide uh, backgrounds. People hide debt. Right? People hide all types of things. Right? People hide all types of things. Right? So uh, you know, just be aware. So he says, Yanbari, it is appropriate for the man who divorces his wife. This is yet again that he gives her a commodity, and it is a commodity that is something that weighs on her imagination. It's something that weighs on her imagination. Something nice, something thoughtful. Allah Tabarakul Ta'ala states in Al-Baqarah verse 241, again Al-Baqarah 241, And the women who are divorced, the women that men have divorced them, it is for them to have a good gift. As a right over the men of taqwa. As a right upon the men that have taqwa, that are conscious of Allah. Right? So if you have taqwa and you're divorcing this woman, at the time of departure, you're going to try to do something for her. Whatever something is. Right? Whatever something is. Right? And, um, you know, we, we know how it go. Maybe she has a family to go back to. Maybe she doesn't. Maybe she needs a little bit of help. In order to get herself, you know, level because she's been somewhat dependent on you. You've been taking care of her, right? And the quality of life that you have provided, she may not have that same quality of life immediately until she resettles. Don't use the fact that you know that she's entering into some instability as a weapon against her, as some type of get back. Because men do this, right? Women know, right? Y'all can tell me if I'm lying. Men do this, being, being vindictive, right? All right. So uh, we actually wanted to enter into and complete the next chapter as well, Babu Ishratin Nisa, the chapter of living with women well, right? How do you live with your wife happily, right? We wanted to uh, complete this as well. Uh, we, actually, we actually could, to be honest with you, um, based on the time that we have here, but we don't want to be overly long-winded. And we don't want to lose your attention either. So we will forward this until next week, inshallah ta'ala. sallallahu ala Muhammad. Now, um, we see that they, there's several statements and like questions from our participants online. We're going to scroll back and scroll through. Oh my goodness. Okay, you guys have been pretty active today. Huh? Okay, la ilaha illallah. Let's see now. Can we scroll through? All right. 
Lighten means something to facilitate within your means, nothing too heavy, but also not the lightest. That is correct. Um, we're still scrolling through here. So, Shaykh, some use the excuse of the hadith where Maha was 400 dirham. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yes, the hadith states 500 dirham, but 500 dirham is the equivalent of 42 sheep. Uh, this was the, the value of the average dowry, the standard dowry of the Messenger of Allah during his life. So we would have to ask the question, what is the value of 42 sheep today? Uh, we did the numbers on it, and we're somewhere in the range of 4200 to $8,400 USD, United States dollars, right? So then there's that, right? Then there's that. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, the best dowry is the one that is easiest. We, we discussed the, the detail of, of that as well. We, we need to relate that or connect it to a khulat because if you make it easy for yourself to get into the marriage by way of a cheap dowry, then it's easy for your wife to get a khulat and exit from the marriage, right? Do you want your wife to divorce you? It'll be easy for her to divorce you. Ask yourself that question. If you're okay with that, go ahead and give a cheap dowry. No problem. Um... Okay, Jazakallah Khair, some use that to pressure the woman and to bargain. That is correct. You're a great teacher, MashaAllah. May, may Allah grant you paradise. Truly appreciate that. Uh, I agree. Allahumma barak. May Allah bless all of us. All right. Still scrolling through these questions here. It's a lot of activity today. A lot of activity. Um. Can the husband force the reduction of the dowry after the marriage, basically forcing her to give a portion back? No. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Mm -mm. No, once the dowry is once the dowry is agreed upon, he owes that. Right? He owes that until Yom Qiyam, until the day of resurrection. His only out, his only out is if you, the wife, you choose to forego your right. In whole or in part Just like if a person owes you something They're indebted to you You can forgive them of their debt If you choose to But that's the woman's right A husband, you can't force your wife to give up her right That's her choice and it's her right Right? Hopefully that's pretty, that's pretty clear Let's keep going here We can't hear the people who are sitting there Maybe you can repeat their questions Excellent Uh <laughs> You want to put you want to play you got to pay <laughs> All right uh, questions from the floor Yes So so if I get $15,000 You get $15,000 or equivalent to or the equivalent of she want a divorce and I be like no nah, sister you owe me $15,000 Yes So I can you said I can imprison her in this marriage. <laughs> you saying that with a smile on your face, brother? No, no, and they, they just no, asked no, me to repeat I'm the not, questions too. I'm Go ahead. <laughs> no. Go ahead. She tracked mm -hmm. unless I agree to lighten up on her, but that's if she wants the, the pull up, right? Uh huh. Okay, good. So, so the question is asking: um, as a husband, the husband gives fifteen thousand dollars as a dowry, right? And um, a lot of women would accept that. Would you accept fifteen grand as a dowry? 15 stacks? Let's see, they, they shaking their head yes to that one, right? Okay, they, they'll, they'll take 15 stacks, okay? They'll take that. All right, fine. So the question is now asking, if she's asking for a khulat, that 15,000 is due, right? But so maybe she ain't got the 15,000. So can the husband, in effect, imprison his wife because she doesn't have the ability to give him back that 15,000? No. Because again, the khulat is the exact reverse of coming into the marriage with the dowry, right? So the same way, when you came into the marriage, you had the option of paying that dowry before the marriage, at the time of the ceremony, at the time of the ceremony, or sometime throughout the duration of the marriage, or even if the marriage ended, you're still indebted to her. The khulat is the exact reverse. Now you married to her. Even though 
you may or may not have paid the dowry yet. You're still married to her. Likewise, when she gets the hula, right, you gave her the hula, now she owes you the 15000 It's a debt. So she can pay it, right, before the hula, at the time of the hula, or if it's after that, yeah, you're still divorced, but now she owes you that money back. It's the exact reverse. It's the exact reverse. That money, <laughs> that money gone. That money gone. Well, well, again, 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 right? Just like, because it's the exact reverse. So just like the woman has the right to forgive or forego her right, the husband knows that she don't got the ability to do it for real, right? So you can just uh, do what you can or just don't even worry about it. You're good, right? Don't even worry about it. You have the right to forgive her of that, of that debt if, if you so choose, right? But it's a right. It's a right. So, you know, some men might want a hard line and like, nah, sis, you owe that. Right? In our culture, you might as well forego it. In our culture, you might as well forego it. Right? But some men, they try to, some men try to hold it. Right? That's the last little bit of control they think they got over this one. They're going to hold that. You know what I mean? So, but Allah, Mr. I. Uh, go ahead. Because I thought you were saying that she can't divorce mm -hmm. unless she gives you that money back. Mm -hmm. And that, when you were saying that made you have her think. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why I asked that question. No, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, brothers, sisters, any other questions? We don't see anything else uh, from our online participants here.